At Fitfiliate, we're excited to announce the Affiliate Engineering Seminar. Coming soon to an affiliate near you, don't miss this exciting opportunity to create the affiliate of your dreams. Link in show notes or in bio to read. And welcome back to our next episode of the Fit Affiliate Podcast. Today, super, super excited to have a very special guest with us, the one and only Kevin Ogar, owner of CrossFit Watchtower, seminar staff, adaptive staff member, and CrossFit affiliate rep and doing all sorts of amazing things out in the CrossFit landscape. Also joined by my two partners in crime, Andrew Charlesworth and Tony, as always, the rock on which we are built. Welcome, everyone. That was Thanks for having me on. But the introduction, Hello. why does it just always sound better when you have, like everybody gets a better introduction with Lisa's accent, so I'm just jealous. <laughs> Because she sounds like she's about to just uh, do some sort of John Wick like situation, like she's a John Wick villain or someone who helps John Wick. That's fair. Jeez. I did. I, I did just watch The Beekeeper, which is either a love it or hate it type movie, and the the one guy in it, he's Australian. And every time I see an Australian, I unfortunately am now duped into thinking of Lisa. It's like it's not that's, a good thing. That's not a bad thing in your day to think of me more often. Anyway, no, moving on. Uh, Pump the Kevin's here. Um, been wanting to get you on here for a long time so thank you for for joining us on this episode you are in fact one of the busiest men in crossfit so uh you have no I shortage have of perspective uh, well at least you you've got enough hats to wear I mean, maybe that's what all those hooks are behind you so did you just normally wear them and hang them up back there uh those are for coffee cups but right now they're all getting washed because apparently uh people don't like to wash their own coffee cups so i take them home like once a week. So I'll add that to, to the list of things that Kevin does is the dishes. I do do the, I don't mind dishes. That's the deal. If I do the dishes and the cooking, my wife does everything else around the house. And so I took that deal immediately. <laughs> I love it. That's um, a good deal. Well, sweet. I mean, everybody starts out the same way on this podcast. And, and generally that's just the background story. I mean, I know you have, you've been around for a really long time. I think everybody mm -hmm. in your, in your field or your region knows you, but for everybody else that's listening to it, you have a, a a pretty radical story, a pretty cool story. So, yeah. I guess start let's start at the beginning, if you don't mind, and tell everybody how you found and got into CrossFit, and then how you end up with seventeen hats in CrossFit now. Oh man, um, I did my first CrossFit workout in two thousand seven. Yeah, um, I was a big old roly poly power lifter. Um, walking on treadmills was hard. More than three reps was cardio, type stuff. Um, and uh, I got introduced to it. I started doing personal training and um, the guy who was running personal training, a guy named Jeremy Yates, um, basically uh, played on my ego to get me to try a CrossFit workout. And he's like, you should come try this with us. And I was like, no, nah, man, I'm a big old fat kid. I'm not, I'm not doing that, all that work. And he's like, well, my little tiny girlfriend um, is going to do it. You don't think you can beat her in it? And I was like, oh, well, okay. Um play on my ego i'll do it and so he made me do 21 15 9 handstand push-ups and l pull-ups mm. was the workout uh i put a giant kevin sized hole in the wall trying to do a handstand um, <laughs> i've never done one before <laughs> i realized i sucked at it um then like two days later came in and did murph because the whole training group was doing murph so i did murph with them and realized i really sucked at it and so um spun me on to start doing that uh started competing in cross like 2009 um and did that until 2014 i was paralyzed in a, a barbell accident someone stacked some plates behind me in a competition out in california uh bailed backwards like you're supposed to ricochet off and hit me in the back paralyzed me from t11 down and um you know new fitness was important to me had been my entire life i started lifting when i was like 12. So I jumped right back into it, started sneaking out of the hospital at like two weeks to go back to the gym because they wanted me to do like lat pull downs and like rickshaw dips. And I thought that was stupid. Yeah. Um, and so jumped right back in and started having to try to, there wasn't a lot out there. There's a few guys out there who were doing uh, CrossFit from a wheelchair and uh, leaned on those guys a lot, but just started trying to figure out how to adapt this CrossFit stuff to make a... Uh, a functional system of training for for people in wheelchairs really that's what that was the main goal is just wheelchairs and then the open hit and me and those guys who had been leaning on decided to do a nice little competition with ourselves there's like five of us and um 
the next year we had people with different disabilities asking if they could join and we had to figure out how to adapt that. And that just kind of spurred on to what we have now, which is the adaptive CrossFit game stuff where we have 15 different divisions. Um, cool. And, and kind of led in with that. I got a, I also got the opportunity in 2014 to intern for seminar staff. Um, Dave and uh, Greg asked if I wanted to uh, give it a shot and, uh, it's terrifying having coached my entire life from two legs and only having like, I don't know, eight months to try to figure out how to coach from a chair and did that. Luckily they made the mistake and let me on staff and, um, been on staff ever since the, the rep roll stuff really started in 2020. Um, when, you know, all that stuff went down, I started calling affiliates and chatting with them outside of being hired by CrossFit just to kind of see what's going on and let them know like the flagship that is or the, the flag or the the battle cry that is CrossFit was important and they shouldn't jump ship quick fast and in a hurry because of this that or the other and mm -hmm. um got asked to do like the part-time affiliate rep role and that filtered into the role I have now you didn't forgot to say where your favorite internship was uh that it was in Chicago yes in it Chicago. was yeah, right. uh, it was with Charlesworth he had long hair then, um, still yeah. as massive a human as ever, but super yeah. long beautiful hair, and I miss it. A little but thicker. It was great. a little thicker. Um, and we benched together. We did. Hmm. We did. Yeah. yeah. That was fun. So I think Lisa can just Photoshop some hair back on to Andrew for this call, so it'll make it feel yeah. like more nostalgic. Yeah. This call is very hard because I am personally, personal, deep friends with Kevin. So all I want to do is just, like, like, take the mask off right now and be like, dude, this is this that's is exactly awesome. what Maybe. this call is supposed to be because basically that's well, what all of these are do it yeah you know i, I mean I, I i i would love for people to hear two reps talk so i'm going to ask him a brief question I, I did my call yesterday kevin which i'm not working yet but i i, I want to see the affiliates it's part of like what you just said you just did you just called people because you're a good guy you call the affiliate owners because you care about their well-being i'm i'm finding it fun and challenging to reconcile and balance both sides. Do you ever feel like you and I are exactly in the middle of like some sort of, not to use politics, but like far right, far left, like thing. And then oh, here's, yeah. here's the reps just directly in the middle. And like, how do you balance and reconcile that without losing your shit? Well, and this goes back, um, you know, to the part where like you have like this my injury is, is part of it honestly like you had to learn patience i wasn't i'm not a i wasn't a very patient person pre-injury but this this injury will teach you patience quick fast in a hurry so i think i got a lot of it from there and then when we first started this role me and andrew um jordan holland gave me a book called uh crucial conversations it's great book. And there's um a phrase in there that has been stuck in my mind ever since i read it which was why would a rational person act this way Hmm. because i don't can i don't you, truly can you know. dive into that a little bit yeah i don't think the majority of people are irrational i don't think people won't listen to reason when when presented and so when you go into a conversation whether it's a hard conversation or you're in the middle of two things and you ask yourself like why would a rational person act this way and you can kind of get into the mindset of like what type of emotions they're feeling what must be going what else must be going on in their life it's a lot easier to go into a call where someone's mad and yelling at you and go like hey Dude, I get it. I understand why you're upset. Here's here's what I would feel if I was in your situation. Well, let's talk about the reality of the situation. And it makes it a lot easier to to have those hard conversations or be stuck in the middle of it. Because yeah, like it's if I mean, I would say the majority of people are kind of dead center. But yeah, you have your your far far left and far right field people where some people who are like gung ho and and want you to do more and more and more. And there's just not not enough time of the day. And there's other people who are just like. I'm so mad and pissed that I want you to never speak to me again. And um, I think those are the ones going into like, Hey, like why would a rational person act this way? And how can I let them know that I'm trying to understand their situation if they calm down and just speak to me? Yeah, that's true. I love that. You know what did that for me? I don't read a lot of books. I only listen or whatever, but like the movie captain fantastic. You guys seen that? Nope. You know what that is. Are you okay? Lisa, Thank you. Can you summarize <laughs> why I, that would be the same? Like, it, do you know what I'm saying? Like, he, he literally was so rational with his children that there were times in the movie that you're like, this fucking guy gets it. 
they're like his kids would be like they did like hundreds of burpees every day they lived out in the woods and he would just come in and tell them exactly what was going on and he would like have them memorize you know bill of rights and dictionary and sometimes you'd be like hell yeah and then sometimes you'd be like these kids are a little too savage like they didn't know how to actually function and sometimes you were rooting for him and against him and but he, he was so rational that you were kind of like he took the emotion out of every single thing like well, their mom had go ahead I, well, I think the the emotion part is a big part it's like a lot of people have emotions and emotions are great they're good they're necessary but i don't think a lot of people when they have an emotion sit back and think like why am i actually having this reaction why am i having this emotion right. i was at a friend's house one time and the the kid came uh, one of the kids came in crying and she asked him a question that like blew my mind. And she's like, are you hurt or are you embarrassed? Mm. And it's like, okay, let's take a second. When you have a big emotion, think like, why, what am I actually having this emotion about? And like having the emotions fine, having it dictate how you act or react to something isn't. And so like, I think sitting back for a second and you, you, you don't like in this modern age where everyone just reacts emotionally on social media immediately, I think we'd have a lot a lot better platform for things if people sat back for a second that said like why am i having this emotion emotion what is a productive way of expressing that emotion and then moving forward with that and i think if you can understand that about people um and their reactions and where their emotions coming from uh, it's a lot easier to handle people who are upset with you totally i mean there's there's lots of data actually to support that exact conversation i mean crucial conversation is a great book everybody probably should read it especially if you happen to deal with the public, like, I don't know, affiliate owners and coaches have to do, because it does give you essentially a good hedge against it. But you know, people in general are not irrational. They just the way that they interact with the stimulus more often, not to your point, is very emotional and very irrational. Right? like there's there's lots of stories about that one. And, and I do think one of the things that we tell people a lot, or at least I tell people a lot, is getting to a place where you can become an active observer in your own life versus an active participant is an easy way to step outside of that emotional interaction. Where, you know, to your point about, you know, experiencing or even with the, with the child, are you hurt or are you injured or embarrassed rather? It's really about teaching a child at a very early age to observe how I'm going to interact with this this thing that I'm feeling this potential pain or, or situation. Whereas most people want to be an active participant, right? This thing made me feel a certain way. Therefore, I'm going to act a certain way in relationship to it. But if you can better understand why somebody potentially would be bringing something to you and you could observe it and not react to it, uh, I do think that that is, that is one of the things that is probably more freeing, especially as somebody myself who's dealt with quote unquote anger management issues my whole life. One of the things that I had to do to be able to step away from that was to be able to be an observer as opposed to a participant because my first reaction was always to participate like i wanted to react to pretty much everything and then i think the patients you're owning an affiliate is a part of that but maybe a little bit of its old age but the rest of it is just always always analyzing people's behavior and being like huh people do weird things not because they're weird but because they interpret things weirdly and that becomes but, a very fascinating thing that, that's the hard part in this day and age with social media especially because yeah. like i don't know how many people know this but like your your brain naturally takes in information about people's body language and tone without you ever knowing it and it actually factors in on how you react without you ever really realizing it someone's body language is telling you how to react to something and with social media and like just seeing people on zoom calls it's really hard to yeah. understand tone or see body language and yeah. like if if we're going to do something that's going to affect someone in there in person and we can see their body language and we cause hurt or 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 like feelings about it we think twice about it, but if we can say it without having to visually take in how it affects someone else, it's a lot easier. It's like, uh, you know, the keyboard warriors, they, they don't have to see how they affect people and there's no threat of being punched in the face. Yeah. And I think more punches <laughs> in the face. Necessary. You know, <laughs> I think as humans too, we're really quick to um, define ourselves by, you know, I am angry or I am annoyed or I am irritated mm -hmm. versus I am feeling angry or I'm feeling mm -hmm. right. So we, give ourselves that label and then we go even subconsciously is like, well, if I, I am angry, this is what an angry person does. And then have some sort of entitlement that, you know, it doesn't matter what carnage I cause on the way through, but it's my right to express what I am in this particular moment and, and have lost that, you know, like you said, Kevin, to a degree, like people don't have to get the feedback of all the consequence from just, you know, saying whatever it is they have to say or doing whatever it is they have to do. And they can be somewhat detached for it while keeping that identity of I'm angry, I'm 
this, I'm that, rather than it's just a feeling and you can either change it or manipulate it or, you know, step back from that and not be in the middle of the fire. Well, I, I, the big part uh, Yeah, it's just a quote. You go. I was just say, like, um, the big part about that is, like, if you're an active observer in your own life, like you said, Tony, it's a lot easier to admit when you're wrong. Mm-hmm. If you have this belief that I am, I am right and I am angry, it's almost impossible to admit you're wrong without losing face. But if I'm yeah. sitting back and going, like, oh, yeah, I had this feeling. It wasn't the proper reaction or feeling to this. I'm okay with admitting I'm, I'm wrong because I see that it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of people who identify with their feelings and react with their feelings, you're never going to convince them that they're that they're wrong Absolutely. because they have hunkered down into that that stigma of like, no, I'm right. I'm angry. I'm right to be angry. Therefore, you have to be wrong. Opposed to like, I'm having a feeling, but it may not be the right one. Mm. To, to quote Dr. Uh, Brian Shantosh, he's got doctor <laughs> in front of his title today. I, I don't know what stuck with him, but right. I did not until today. Um, he, what stuck with me, I listened to his podcast like religiously for a while, and just the whole don't let your mood have majority vote. It doesn't, it doesn't get majority vote. It never does. It does not have that opportunity. And I, I think when you mix that with the new lady who Rogan had on recently, who wrote the book, How We're Ruining Our Children, basically by saying, hey, are you sad? Or, you know, I, let's talk about your sadness. Like, no, fucking forget about your sadness. Go go look at that tree. Go, go do anything. Go smell something. Do anything but ruminate on why you're angry because you make it grow. And like when you combine those two things, you become invincible. Where the fuck did we go with this? This is great. Whoever's <laughs> listening to this is getting gifts, but like <clears throat> they wanted to like, hear about. There's a lot of value in this conversation, though, because for one, I think it's important that they realize that the people who they they are presenting their struggles and their frustrations to understand how to maintain a level head and not become active participants and emotionally incensed by the feedback they're getting. And, and hopefully anybody who is an affiliate owner and, you know, maybe you guys are in fact, their field rep like that, that should be incredibly comforting to know that like, wow, this person is not going to inherently just become the talking head or the mouthpiece of HQ. Like they're a very trusting, very emotional, very level headed person. So I think that reason it's, it's very uh, valuable, but mostly it's, it's that, you know, to understand the concepts of this, which are very, very big and very, very skill based conversations to some degree are so helpful when you sit in an affiliate because so many affiliate owners are actively trying to avoid conflict and confrontation and hope that like that becomes their path to success. But they don't realize that like the thing that they're literally paid for or paid to do by their clients is confrontation, right? It's your job to to bring conflict and confrontation so that you together can create resolution. And so that book is actually crucial conversations is a great way to do it because if you're not having uncomfortable conversations with your clients, you're probably just cheering them on and that's great until it runs its course. And so I think for that reason, there's a lot of value here. So even though it might not have been your intention, Charles worth happy you you touched on it. Well, and I think the big, big thing for affiliate owners, I think this is where it's really important is I can't tell you how many affiliate owners, I've talked to that have damn near ruined or ruined their business because of their reaction to other affiliates or mm-hmm. their own members. Oh, my, my members start their own gym. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to talk badly about them. I'm going to let my emotions about what they're doing run this. Oh, someone else opened up down the street. That makes me angry. I'm going to let that dictate how I come into my gym. And whether you like back to the, like your everyone, everyone intakes body language immediately. If you're going into your gym and you're angry all the time because someone else opened up a gym and you don't think your members know it because you think you're good at hiding it, you're, you're full of it. Everyone knows. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, that was one of my biggest, like one of my bigger downfalls in the first couple of years, you know, struggling with, you know, being an affiliate owner, doing all this stuff and being in a chair. Like there were weeks or even months of where I would come in and I'm like, oh, I'm hiding how upset I am really yeah. well from my members. I was not. Yeah. So if, sure. you can't, if you can't sit back as an affiliate owner and be like, okay, here's my emotion to someone opening a gym close to me. Here's my emotion to this member leaving um, for these reasons and assess those, assess those emotions and figure out a productive way to make your gym better. Then you're going to have a hard, really hard time when the affiliate as an affiliate owner. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. 
the, it's funny because you cool. guys get it as seminar staff instructors, right? Like we would go into these gyms and what was always fascinating is that every gym owner does think they hide it really well. Like they're, they're playing the game, like they've got the suit on and they're going to win an Emmy award for this thing. But like every time you go to an affiliate, everybody that, or to a seminar, everybody that's taking the seminar is talking about their asshole owner, right? Every <laughs> owner that's hosting the gym for the most part is like, and you're like, wow, the stereotype or the archetype of, of the the disgruntled gym owner is much more relevant or prevalent than you think it is. And not to say that like gym owners are all inherently bad. It's just that you, you got to stop reacting to things because people can read it. Well, and it's, yeah, it's, hard. it's hard because like you're putting your heart and soul into this gym. Like you are giving yeah. almost every ounce of yourself to these individuals. So it's hard not to react with emotion. It's um, you know, I'm not a parent, but I imagine it's a lot like parenting when you're, when your kid tells you that they hate you and you have to react, you know, with love and kindness instead of just backhanding them across the room. <laughs> I just tell him to and fuck off. <laughs> I just say, that's it. Tony, here's what I'm getting though. Go ahead, Lisa. No, I was just going to say, you know, as, as an affiliate owner, you know, that was always something that was hard is, you know, something would happen and I'd spend a week like miserable sulking about it until someone um, pointed out to me going, well, while you're worried about this thing that happened a week ago, you're actually not getting anything else done. You're not moving forward. So then I brought in a rule like you've got five minutes to bitch, moan, cry, kick the walls, complain. But at the end of the five minutes, you have to do one thing that will move you forward. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter how small. Send an email to someone. Doesn't matter. You get five, And I actually had to, and I still do it today, is set a timer on my phone because I know otherwise I'll sit in that, that. Uh, the, you know, a week and then suddenly go, oh, I haven't done all those other things. I haven't rung those leads. And you can, it's, it is really easy when you're in the middle of the fire to get stuck in that, that space yeah. of everything's hard and unfair. Well, and I think that's why, that's why Charles Worth runs, runs one. I run one most of the affiliate, but I think actually all the affiliate reps run one like a, like a biweekly or a weekly call with our, with our region. And the reason why I think these are so important is because it is hard. And you do have to have a place where you can vent some of these things. And you do have to talk to people who understand it. And no one outside of affiliate owners understand what it's like being an affiliate owner. I can't think of another job that you you give so much and you build this giant community. And you kind of have to be one foot in, one foot out. Because you can't be buddy, buddy friends with everyone because it's transactional. It's a business. But you have to be one foot in to, to build that community. And so a lot of these affiliate owners for the longest time felt like they're by themselves. And so these, these masterminds, these round tables that we put on, I think they're so important because you can come on there and be like, dude, if one more member leaves out a band on the floor or attached to the rig, I'm going to burn this building down. <laughs> and people understand it. And like I say that all the time and people giggle and laugh and it's funny, but it's also true. Like you have to have some place to get that five, 10 minutes, at least calls an hour, these hour uh, sessions to talk about these things. And, um, brainstorm on how to fix them or hear someone else's story and i know there's other people experiencing these things um well not only that though kevin it's really important because it's regional like at, at the end of the day it's th different things go on in the midwest than go on in your basically all the united states middle um yeah. that you have you know and the the funny part is like i've been made fun of by people before who all their job is to do is to, you know go i'm not going to say names but like they were like that seems arrogant to say that just join join this call. You're going to get the value of your affiliation. Fuck yeah, you are, dude. I, I told my call that the other day. There are people who have consistently not missed a Tuesday. And since I've been having this thing for over a year, and I guarantee they will preach. I don't need them to because I don't get paid extra. But they would be like, I have gotten $10,000 worth of information from this call. There was one time where we just had everyone like everyone pulled up their uh their internet and cell phone bill and we all cross compared it like hey how low can we get this shit and i remember people coming back the next week and they're like dude i just saved 550 dollars because i i went to spectrum and i bundled and i said and i and i was like hell yeah because no one frowns on a jet ski no one frowns on a jet ski do you feel me <laughs> You're riding a jet ski. You cannot be unhappy. No one is frowning and bitching when they're happy. And mo monetary success does rely on that. Sorry. Well, we had we had a we we have our call and we had a 
one of the guys who jumps on regularly gain like three or four members through some of the marketing stuff that we talked about. If he, he keeps those members for a year, which I'm sure he will. He's a great affiliate owner. He's a great coach. Um, there's your affiliate fee plus. Yeah. Some. Yeah. Like it, I, I think, I think sometimes people are looking for like the, the big payouts instead of seeing like the long term, like the short term, like I, I need money now opposed to like, here's the long term. Uh, here's, my bill without, here's the things I need to do. It's, it's um, sometimes I think some, some of the stuff that me and Charlesworth do as reps is like the mobility of CrossFit where like, yeah. it's going to be really good for you. You really need to do it. And everyone just squeaks out once you tell them to do it, mm -hmm. but yeah. you'd be way better at CrossFit and in life in general yeah, for sure. you just listened to the damn coach and did the mobility. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think I've, I've said it on here cause we've had a few of you guys on specifically the North American or the U S ones. Like, Hands down, the the best thing that CrossFit has done, at least in the last 10 years, was the development of the, the support role that is, this is your team and both worldwide and otherwise, mainly for that exact reason. Just if nothing else, finally, there's somebody that you can go to, right? There, there's somebody to support you, listen to you, hear you and understand you. Whereas in the past, it was like you could probably send an email, but you might not get an answer until you got a Christmas card at the end of the year type of thing. Like there was just, there was nothing there, but I think a lot of people confuse support and, and direction to some degree too. Cause like there's a, I know there's a big hurdle there and they're like, well, tell me what to do. Right. They, they do, they do want that JG Wentworth conversation. Like I want, I want cash now, right? Like they need to figure this out. And the problem you guys get run into this as much as anybody, but this whole thing, Fit Philly was all built on this exact conversation. They have everything they need to be successful. Now, they, even more so with, with the addition of you guys and your calls and the value, because the thing that they need is the methodology, right? How you apply and implement it is how you build your business. But they get so distracted with what they should be doing, they don't think about what they could be doing. And then that just creates this whole frustration. And I know you guys see it on that end, but I do agree that the those calls that never existed before are worth tens of thousands of dollars because and i know this because there's other guru organizations out there that literally sell group calls for thousands of dollars alongside an affiliate playbook which they literally get as a part of being an crossfit affiliate for basically for free right for 4500 yeah. bucks i wish i wish affiliate owners kind of knew two things i wish they knew more than that but i think two things would be really helpful for them one how easy it is to reach out to like the reps. Like I've had so many people email affiliate support and affiliate sports, a very, very small team. They are inundated with emails. It takes a little bit for them to get back to you because they have to sift through first come first serve. Yeah. If you reach out to your rep, we generally answer within 24 hours. We're in on the inside doing all the work for you to figure out the best option for you. We're all, you know, affiliate owners or former affiliate owners. And so we understand what you're going through. So I wish people knew like, instead of just sending to a blank email, like I'm not saying don't email affiliate support, but I am saying, Try us first. We can usually get it done for you faster because affiliate sport has to deal with all 13,000 affiliates. We're dealing with a small section and we can get in there and get it done. The second thing I wish uh, affiliate owners knew, and this is something that's happened, uh, that I've learned from, from this role, is that I see two things make an affiliate, like every single successful affiliate I know that I have in my region that I've talked to that's bringing in, you know, 60 to 100 plus K a month has two things. They have a dedicated coaches development program. They have a mentor. Without fail, all the most all the most successful gyms in my region. Like there's one that brings in like 120k a month. Guess who still has a mentor? Mm -hmm. Guess who still has a dedicated coach development program? Like you have to have someone checking your 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 business stuff, but you also have to develop your product, which is your coaching. If you think it's anything other than your coaching, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like you see some affiliate owners drift towards the business side and they forget the coaching or they drift towards the coaching side. And I was, this is my fault when I first opened drift towards the coaching side and forget the business side. And so like having a mentor and a dedicated, regularly scheduled coach development program, those two things will make your business or your affiliate successful. Well said, Kevin. Well said. Very well said. I think what's also important and really what you said in there too, is that, with each new level comes the new devil, right? And so I think a lot of people think that mentors are only for like the beginners, but as you get further and further, 
it gets more and more and more important that there's somebody there or a multiple somebody's there. And, you know, as you guys climb the ladder, mentors just give way to new mentors. And I think that's a, a big piece of it. That if you look around, even outside the affiliate landscape, very few people who are, are let's call it ultra successful, have only one, maybe even two mentors. There's dozens of them at that point. And I agree with that. Like, support is a, it wears a lot of different hats and i think it's good that people understand that like oh it's not a beginner thing it's actually a long-term thing and that 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 role looks different as that time goes on well and i think both having a coach's development program and having a mentor speaks to two things understanding that you're not perfect at anything you do you can always get better and it's really hard it's not impossible but it's really hard to make yourself better without someone else's help that's why we have training partners that's why CrossFit is community, uh, like a community event and a community facility works. It's because you're like, think about it, like how hard is it to truly push yourself to, as much as you can in your garage by yourself? I mean, Ariel Lowen doesn't, but I think she's a freak. She's awesome, but she's also like an outlier. But generally, you need to have someone pushing you to get better, and that's just not in fitness. That's in that's in your coach's development, and that's in um, that's in your business. I mean, Charles wasn't gone through it with me. Like we've gone through how many trainer summits where we go there and you have like the top dogs of coaching in the CrossFit space, like sitting there watching your coaching and giving you feedback. That's, that's what's special about the seminar team is like most people, all the people I know on the seminar team crave feedback on how to get better. Don't tell me what I did. Well, I don't care. I want you to tell me where I'm failing and tell me, give me a pathway to move forward with it. I think Kevin, and I think what Tony said too relates to what you said, where, um, you gave those two things, coaches development and then having a mentor. But that's not sexy and shiny. Um, it's not a quick fix and it's not easy to sell because it's the same thing with millionaires. Large study in millionaires. Everyone's heard this. What do they have? Paid for house, 401k. Very boring. Very boring. What's really fun? Download this program and I will teach you to options trade, baby. I will, you know, even me, like everyone knows them huge Bitcoin guy, but like that marketing, what's the quickest fix to get somewhere? And like, no, it's, it's not quick. Have your mentor for years and then, and then have them come like have become best friends at some point, yeah. do your coaches develop, make your coaches the best possible coaches you can. Um, that's super, super good. But what, what sells is the quick, shiny, sexy stuff. Well, and I've always asked myself this, and maybe you guys can answer this question. I don't know how much of it is affiliate owners just don't know about mentors because a lot of affiliate owners get in here without any business background. They just want to help people. They're good at coaching fitness, and they just go go for it. So how much of it is they just don't know that mentors are important? And how much of it is ego? Like, I don't want to let no, someone know that I'm failing. I don't want to let someone know that I'm not good at these things. And so I'm just going to suffer through it and see if I can figure it out myself. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, noble, um, but... It's a that's a that's a loaded question in a lot of regards. I think there, as it applies to the mentorship and the awareness of it, it, there's there's two problems with it. The first one is that there's a lot of people who will prey on and moonlight as mentors and distract the conversation and let people think that like back to Charlesworth's Bitcoin conversation. There's enough gurus out there who are like they'll sell you the solution, and really what they're doing is selling you belief that they are the solution and that you don't possess that solution yourself. And where mentorship becomes incredibly important, true mentorship, really, which is just true coaching, is that a good mentor doesn't teach you anything. They pull from you the thing that's the most important because to kind of bring this full circle in this whole conversation, everything we've kind of talked about today is that behavior becomes the most important predictor of your success. And so like you talk about people who want feedback or people who you know gravitate towards this or how they react in conversations or, or stimulus. And like this becomes a big part of those who seek mentorship you know, there's there's a saying from a, a psychologist and she said that within the first five minutes, I can tell whether I'm dealing with a big kid or a little kid. And by that, she just means, you know, we're all just kids in big bodies and little kids are the ones who point their fingers at everything and it's everybody else's fault. You know, to, to quote, you know, Dr. Shantosh, you know, the, the greatest curse of all is to believe your own bullshit. Right. And so little kids believe their own bullshit. They're pointing at everything. You're the bad guy. You're the bad guy. You know, your mom and dad, your mom and dad. Whereas like big kids. We grow up and we say, hey, if everybody's the asshole, I think I'm the asshole, right? Like, and that's, and until you get to that point, and maybe it is, you know, it's such an enlightenment as becoming an active observer in your own life, being like, 
uh oh, I think I'm the constant in the problem. Do you start to become receptive to the mentorship conversation? Because up until that point, people I think seek mentorship, but they seek information with the intention to abdicate responsibility as opposed to take responsibility. Like they want to buy, download, follow, or prescribe to whatever person is going to solve this problem because not that they don't want to get out of the situation, but what they know that if I pay for this thing from this person who claims to solve my problem, when it doesn't go right, it's not my fault this time. It's their fault. But you have to make that switch into becoming the big kid being like, hey, listen, it doesn't matter what you tell me. You could give me the literal framework of how to make it to the CrossFit games, step by step, workout by workout, day by day. But immediately I'm going to iterate that based on my willingness to get uncomfortable and what I have going on in my life and my, you know, even what equipment's available to me. Therefore, the whole thing is ruined. So why don't you just take a look at like, what am I not doing to be successful? And what do I need to stop doing to start being successful? So to your point, Kevin, I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a distraction from a marketing perspective because to Charles's point about sexy things, sex sells, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean scantily clad people, but it means like, you know, a hundred leads in a hundred days or in a million dollar gyms or, you know, all these things. People are like, holy shit, that seems like it would definitely solve my problem. And the human scarcity brain is always driven towards what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And we try to collect things, but the, the success brain, the abundant brain says, what do I need to stop doing to be successful? And I think a mentor is the only way. In fact, I know a mentor is the only way to help with that conversation because a mentor says, are you an idiot? Like, why, what are, you, why are you doing that again? Or what, why, how did this make it into the idea of good things for you to do today? You know, and you're like, uh, I don't actually know. It just seemed like a good idea because at the core of it all, I guess when it comes time to find a mentor, whether you have a business background or not, or you, you, you know, you're in a situation where you need help. What you need help with is being able to switch from distraction and reaction, which is business is just rife with it. There's no shortage of that and be able to switch to intention. And I think having somebody in your corner to regularly analyze like, Hey, this is where you said you wanted to get to, you know, or this is where you should be trying to get to but this is what you're doing. They're not going to get there. I think you have to get to a certain point in it. And I don't know if it's, they don't know that mentors exist. I think it's a little bit of a lack of trust in terms of like who is a mentor and what does a mentor actually look like? And then I think it's ultimately meeting them where they're at in their journey, whether they're little kids or big kids, if that makes sense. Well, they struggle with decentralized command in the Jocko book. There's the section on decentralized command where they don't trust. They, 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 it's a noble mission. They want to do everything themselves, but then they struggle with delegation and trusting. Like I had a meeting today with the two who are essentially going to, it's like a trial. They're, they're running. They have ideas for the gym. And I said, guys, I, I am your leader. If everything goes bad, it's on me. And if everything goes good, it's completely because of you. You have no stress. So if you have an idea, don't even ask me do it. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, you'll learn from it. I'll clean up the pieces because I'm, I'm the leader then. And I'm not saying like, I'm fucking perfect far from it, but that's just an example where like decentralized command as an affiliate owner is hard to, to learn and to actually do and getting a mentor is part of that. Well, I think the funny thing is, is like coaches are mentors, you know, like if someone comes to your gym and they start snatching. Obviously, they already know how to snatch because they're doing it. But it's my job as their coach to say, like, hey, pull the bar closer, you know, wait to bend your elbows, things like that. Tell them, like, hey, stop doing these things and focus on these things. And, and like, it's funny that a group of people who are around affiliates and their, their product is coaching forget that coaching is, in fact, important. Yeah. And access to multiple coaches is also equally important, right? Like, it's there's plenty of subject matter experts. We get it on the fitness side, but we don't necessarily understand it on the professional side. Or we think that it's a, a to be, imagine being in, in the affiliate being like, oh, I'm bad at weightlifting, snatching and endurance. But, uh, you know, I, I don't need help with those things. I'm just going to keep trying to do this thing on my own. It would probably, you would probably still be fitter than not doing anything on your own. But it's a much faster track to being like, hey, who can help me out there work on these things or take a look at these things? Cause like anybody that comes in as one of those subject matter experts, myself from the gymnastics side, I'm not going to come in and teach you more gymnastics. Like that's, I don't even have time to do that. What I'm going to do, you already know what a muscle up, pull up, bar muscle up, et cetera, looks like. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is what's, why is it a struggle for you? I'm like, 
and potentially show it to me or tell me where your breakdown is in understanding the movement. And that's really all coaching is, whether it be at a physical level, but also at a, at a business-based level. I don't need to come in and tell you what your affiliate needs to look like. You already know what you want your affiliate to look like. I need to figure out behaviorally what's in the way of you being able to execute on that. And generally, more often than not, there's a whole list of things there. That's confidence, could be resources, but it's in many situations, some degree of the psychological imposition, limiting beliefs, you know, imposter syndrome, whatever. But those are all things that are easily fixable once we get to the actual root. But if we keep layering on the distractions, like I could come in and be like, okay, you can't do a bar muscle up. Here's the 30 day muscle up program. And I could give you that. There's fucking almost 0% chance you're going to get a bar muscle up from that, right? You might get way better at pull ups doing it, but they'll feel like they're getting more out of it. This happened every gymnastic seminar. People would be like, you're not, I'm like, I'm not going to give you that. But what happened? Everybody got better by the end of it because all it was was like, show me what you're doing. Show me what you want to do. There's your problem. And they're like, oh. But instead, and they the, were like, they want more tricks and gimmicks. Well, and the thing is, too, when you hand people that, here's, here's your 10 steps to get a bar muscle up, <laughs> the thing that a coach or a mentor would look at is like, well, you had this, and they come back to you and said, I don't still have a muscle up. Well, did you do the things? And you've got someone holding you to account for your actions and behaviors. It's like, well, you got the answers you wanted. Did you actually do anything with it? Which applies, mm -hmm. you know, to business as well. But people think they want the answers, but then they do nothing to execute on those answers. So every affiliate has access to, a, you know, the, the playbook through their portal and all these other things. But they're like, I just want somebody to give me, you know, I want to skip the test, give me the quick answer, but then not doing anything with the information as well which is the behavior little kids want a dad. That's all it is, right? But the little kids want somebody to be their parent. Tell me what to do. Got to become a big kid. Michael. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do think there is, there's a lot to be said about that conversation. That would be its own whole ass podcast. Not the little kid versus big kid thing. I, I, we didn't necessarily, I didn't bring you on here to talk about mentorship, but I think I'm glad that you, you respect and reflect on the fact that like all of your, well, the majority of your successful affiliates in your region all have those two things in common because, you know, it is a no brainer. It's, it's essentially focus on quality of product and then focus on quality of the person behind the product. Right. So it's kind of a no brainer. You know, the thing that I, I was interested in was essentially that though, like, what do you guys see? And it's fun to have both of you on here because you guys have, you know, very, very active regions as regions go um, in terms of like people who engage it, but that's because you guys engage them so well in yourselves, um, maybe through a no bullshit approach sometimes more than others, which I think is probably why <laughs> you two both interest me. Nobody's pulling any punches, but I don't think uh, you know, has pulled a punch with his words the entire time I've known him and I love him for it. No, that's uh when I think I've said this before, but when I first met Charles, which was on that first call, I got thrown to the wolves because that was the first time I officially met him. I was like, this is not going to go well because both of us are just going to not like each other. And then it was the exact opposite. I was like, hello, new best friend. It worked out beautifully. You're beautiful. Um, but I do. I was interested in what you guys think or what you thought was the things that are the predictors of success. And if those are the things that are, what do you consider to be the big impositions or the big limitations that many of them face? If, if those two things are, are the largest predictors of success, mentorship and coach development program, what's the big gap in the sidewalk? I, I think Charles was touched on it and I'll kind of elaborate a little bit. I think the first one is time. You only mm -hmm. have so much time. You have only, you only have so much effort to put like to pour into things. <clears throat> so you got to find people to help you and you have to be willing to, to delegate those, those things. Uh, I think the second one is recognizing your own your own flaws and weaknesses. So when I took this role, I thought, oh, I'm going to do this rep role and run the gym the exact same way and do all these other things 100%. And, you know, I, I had to sit back a couple months in and be like, that's that's not true. I can't I can't do all this by myself. And um, so my wife stepped in, uh, quit her the job she was at. She stepped in to run the gym. First thing I didn't was get her a mentor just to make sure she didn't make the same stupid mistakes I did. And I'm not going to mentor my wife because I can't even coach my wife because she is, in fact, smarter than no, I am. No, absolutely not. That's a great <laughs> session. Um, and so got her a mentor. Um, and and she's made the gym better than I ever did and yeah. more successful than I ever did. And I think the two things that uh, affiliate owners need to, to realize is that you only have so much time. If you're really good at the business side of things, be good at the business side of things and find someone who shares your values to run the coaching. 
I'm good at the coaching side. And in all honesty, I am not that great at the business side. I don't like it. And so I had to find someone who was good at the business side and let me run the coaching side. And so figuring out where to spend your time is important. And also being able to let go of your ego, which we coach in CrossFit, like, hey, no ego past this point. Like everyone starts somewhere and everyone sucks at something. We have to have a, that same mindset of like, you're going to suck at something inside your affiliate. Yeah. Every affiliate owner sucks at something. Find out what that is. Be honest with yourself about it and delegate those things that you suck at to someone that you trust. Yeah. 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 I think um, the what to add the biggest one is I think affiliate owners have to stop thinking money is taboo. And I, you should have the easiest conversations to be like, hey, how much, what's your monthly revenue? I asked all my region that one time. Did everyone respond? Absolutely not. Because basically that's saying, hey, what do you look like naked? And they, they it panicked. And I, I'm like, this shouldn't be awkward. And we've developed a culture where it's extremely awkward because you start an affiliate for a humanitarian mission because you want to help people. And then it kind of got weirded out to where like, if you sell your shirt, you're now a capitalistic freaking pig. And, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? When, how did that happen? You're not going to reach as many people if you aren't in business. And business has to operate with money. That's how, if you don't like it, then I, you can't be a well, human. And I think yeah. part of that, Charles Worth, is that I think a lot of affiliate owners have imposter syndrome. They devalue themselves because they're like a lot of them don't have fancy exercise science degrees, which I'm, you know, 50 50 on whether that's necessary. Um, but they don't have these fancy sci exercise science degrees. They don't have these fancy other things. And they go into this and start coaching people. And they're like, man, I'm just coaching people. I'm doing what I love. You know, I'm going to devalue myself. And I always just kind of remind them like, there's some asshat down at, you know, Globo Gym RX down the street that is charging 140 bucks an hour for personal training and knows nothing mm -hmm. about the human body, knows nothing about actual coaching, knows nothing about the psychology of coaching, knows nothing about forming relationships with these people. It's just taking cookie cutter. Um, and I, I ran personal training programs where I got mad at my uh, people for doing this, where they just find programs online and people come in, they give them a clipboard, the clipboard, check off, check off, check off, check off. The person doesn't know anything and they're charging like a 70 to 100 bucks an hour for personal training. And you mean to tell me that them coming into your gym, <coughs> finding community, finding accountability, finding a, a home and something that's going to actually work for them isn't worth like 10 times that? Yeah. But it's and a I cultural problem, dude. <laughs> you and I both like, know that. I'm Joe Schmo, who, yeah. who just knows CrossFit. It's like that. You know more than a lot of trainers I know. It's and such like, a cultural I, problem, though. I, I would I would take I would take a mediocre to bad CrossFit trainer over most personal trainers that I've seen from inside 100%. 24 hour fitness types of gyms. I, I, I don't know how we crush the culture problem though, Kevin, with with that. Uh, the last podcast that probably won't get produced because my audio was so bad, Lisa. I don't or whatever. I don't know. But we brought up this concept of like coaching as a warm security blanket where when you hate business so much, you actually said you kind of did this where you just run to coaching because it's safe. Like, all right, I'm just going to consume gonna Denise. Have... Yeah, I'm just going to consume Denise Thomas's content, which arguably she's probably the best coach development person on the planet. I mean, I would put her the most right exciting up. one, I swear, sometimes. It has I'm to like, be. Hey, has got to me fired. I'm going to go back to coaching. For, for a trainer. Yeah, for the, yeah, remember that's training. We're gonna do the training coach thing maybe another time because yeah. that's what really Tony sold me on hard. But like that's training, and you run to that when you're scared. When you're scared of the boogeyman in the closet, because the boogeyman is it's I have to pay the rent. My wife's gonna leave me because this passion project I have that truly love is producing nothing and it's taking sixty hours a week of my time. I haven't seen my children, and you know like all these things are happening. And they could not be happening if you hired a coach, I mean a mentor, and you laid out exactly what you want your life to look like. And then that, like Lisa, Lisa was, she come in like, Andrew, well, you're doing this. You said you want this. Are you being a big boy or are you being stupid? I want you to not be stupid. Let's, let's, let's get there. 
Well, you know? I, I think I'll fix. I think one way that I think we can fix this, and this is why I'm so like I'm, I'm one of the guys who started round tables in CrossFit um, back when it was a different program. I have I was very hesitant to do it. I thought it was silly sharing feelings with other people, um, being a redneck from Missouri, um, and then saw how much value I got out of it every single time I went. And I think one of the ways we we change that cultural problem is getting more affiliate owners to talk to each other. Yeah. I think, I, think, I think the hard part is that we have all these very caring, very like I really care type people. I want to help people. And what's very similar across the board when you have a group of people like that is that they are more willing to devalue themselves to help, like basically run their tank dry to help someone else because that's just the kind of person they are. Um, and when you have a person like that and they're, they're isolated and they're by themselves, it's very easy to get caught in your head and said, oh, well, my value is only X when actually – your value is 30 times X. And so if we mm -hmm. get more of these affiliate owners to form a community of affiliate owners, the same way your members find value in themselves by being part of your community, we make the affiliate owners find their own value in themselves by being part of the affiliate owner community. And I think we lost that for a little while. I think there's a lot of infighting from like, this gym's close to me, this gym's close to me. When in reality, the last time I checked, there was less than 1% of the population of Denver where I'm at that CrossFit. That's 99% that I could go help. I shouldn't care about someone down the street for me. That shouldn't affect me because the people who want to go to their gym aren't going to want to come to my gym. My my One of my best friends owns a gym 15 minutes from me. I don't care because the members that go to his, his gym wouldn't like my gym. And the people, members that go to my gym wouldn't like his gym. Yeah, and that's just sure. the way it works. And I think by, by building up these roundtables, giving these affiliate owners information and tools, but I think the big part is having them around other affiliate owners who can say like, no, 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 you are worth more than this. I mean, how many how many conversations, Charlesworth, have you had with affiliate owners that say, I can't raise my prices, my members would leave. And you go, raise your prices, you're worth more than this. And then you get a call a month later and they're like, I'm actually up in revenue because I, I, I did, I lost five members, but I'm up in revenue and can spend more time with the members that stayed who see my value. Right. Then I've, I've had 100, 100 plus of those calls. Yeah, and they're like, those five members that left, I hated them anyway. Yeah, they're problem children anyway. And that's why I tell affiliate owners all the time, like if you raise your prices by like five or ten dollars because you have to pay bills and, and you're honest with them, like, listen, my my rent went up, my electric bill went up, I have to pay coaches more, my coaches need to make a living. So I'm raising my prices by five to ten dollars. And someone says, Not worth it. Okay, get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if I if my if what I'm providing to you, you don't see value in, that's fine. You are allowed to do that. And if I'm not providing you what you think is valuable here's a list of gyms that are around here you can go to. You're probably never going to be happy, but go give it a shot. But I'm going to focus on the people who see value in what I'm doing and I can actually help because I guarantee that many member who doesn't see value in what you're doing for five to $10 more a month is the same member that when you, you come in and say, Hey, scale this way. They're like, now nah, I'm going to hit the RX and they're 15 yeah. minutes over what you, what you thought the workout was going to take. Those are always the same members, almost exclusively yeah. in my experience could be wrong, but almost every single time it's one of those members that I'm like, yeah, they're gone, but they're kind of an ass face. There was ones too. They're like, can you mind if I do open gym in the corner so I can get my extra programming in? Because I don't want to do your programming the way that you want me to do your programming. Because you know, I, yeah. Uh, Every time Net Netflix I, sends me that super nice email, I always respond to them. Oh, thanks. I, thanks for telling me you're going to raise your prices. And then they they send me the owner of Netflix. You know, we chat and I tell them how my day's going, and it's a really like cool concept. So, and I, I joke. <laughs> I, because of that reason, once again, it's like we are the businesses that care so much that we're willing to put out our balls on the table and be like, look, my rent went up, yada, yada, yada. And our members are normally really happy. But like Netflix gives zero fucks like you they're got to reconcile and balance this thing. a little bit. You can just raise your prices, period, because of, of just life. I don't want people to think that like I want I want here and telling everyone how exactly how they do. And I've always done this right. Let me tell you a little story. We work with a lot of adaptive athletes. When I opened my gym, I had my first adaptive athlete come in. I asked him how much he was paying at the gym he was at right then. And he said 50 bucks. That was our adaptive athlete monthly unlimited rate for six years. Six years. And I would always hem and haw like, oh, they have other things to pay for, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. Completely devaluing that I'm one of the only gyms in the area that someone with a disability can come already have programming for, already have this for them. Coaches who are trained to coach adaptive athletes, completely devaluing me and my coaches. 
and I sat down actually with, with Shannon's mentor about it. And he's like, and he's one of my closest friends. And he looks at me and he goes, you're a fucking idiot. And I was like, what? Nice. And then we, we raised the prices. We, we, and it was a big jump. We, we course corrected hard. And, um, I actually had adaptive athletes come to me and say, thank you. They're like, you should have done this years ago. We would have paid more for this. This is, this is not a big deal to us. And so any affiliate owners out there that, that like think that raising their prices aren't, isn't going to be valued. Like members know what they're paying for. I mean, they won't say it and come to you and say, Hey, raise your prices, but they understand the value that they're getting. Like you break down most gyms prices. That's like eight to $12 every single time you come in. If you're coming in like three or four times a week. And I think that some people and affiliate owners, because they get stuck in the the mud and the fire of like everything's shit and everything's hard. If a member was faced between a five or ten dollar a month increase versus the gym not existing, because it's you know they value it so much and this is their place and this is their tribe, more often than not, like you know Andrew said, it was we're we're honest with people and say hey rents up, utilities up, da da da. Like affiliate owners would be less scared about taking that jump because I know the majority of the people would make that decision to go. Well, I need you to be here. That's why so many people kept paying their memberships during you know, closures and things like that, because they're like, no, no, we want the gym to be here when we come back. Like we want this place to exist. It's important to me. It matters. Well, I think it's hard for affiliate owners because some affiliate owners can't wrap their head around like, yes, this is my community. Yes, I built this, but these aren't my best friends. Mm. And they get this mindset of like, if I raise prices, it's like charging my mom for, for, for rent, you know, mm -hmm. but on the flip side of it, I hope affiliate owners know that most of your members see their relationship with you as, as very important, very awesome, but it is transactional. Very transactional. It's, and the second they don't find the value in it, they're gone, which means a produce very good value. Yeah. But also like know, know the value of what you're doing. Um, and I think affiliate owners, I mean, those are the ones I talk to, they're like, Oh, I can't raise it. And I can, I know inside the head, like this person will go and this person will go. And I've known them for eight years. I've trained them for eight years. I've trained them for 10 years. And it's like charging my mom more money for, for rent. Mm -hmm. it's like, that's not what it is. They're paying for a service. You're providing a service, you know, yeah. if like, and I, and like, I always, if your friend worked for a rental car company and he's one of your best friends, you think he'd always just give you a free rental car? No, right. he'd eventually have to charge you for the rental car for the value of that rental car. Yeah. And you'd probably want him to start charging because as soon as it gets fired, you're not going to get a discount or anything because he's going to end up losing the job. Like I think no, you know, no no other field is there this like, oh, I can't charge my members more or my mm -hmm. my clients more or people, my customers more because it's unfair to them. Yeah. Nowhere else. To you know, to go back to the to two problems and the two cracks in the sidewalk, time and money that affiliate owners have. I think I don't think it's a cultural problem as much as I believe it's a behavioral problem that the affiliate model faces in that the barrier to entry is incredibly low. And what I mean by that is that there's a there's a, a thing, there's a psychological quirk that exists in the in the landscape, which is basically called fantasy projection. And this is a pretty prevalent problem for many people, not just affiliate owners. It's essentially at its core, uh, our ability to uh, spend the commission check before we get it type of thing, right? This is where we tend to project out into the future, this, this idea, this execution, this fantasy coming real. And where you see this apply itself to the affiliate model is that many people get into an affiliate or pursue owning an affiliate with this idea of what they're going to become when owning the affiliate without doing any of the work, right? And so what I mean by cash in the check first is that if you project your fantasy and you assume that it's completed at that point, you wouldn't do any of the fucking work necessary to actually bring that thing to life. And you see this with so many people in so many fields, right? Like social media is constantly about this. People renting jets and stuff like this, projecting these fantasies out into it. But like you see this in the affiliate landscape where people get into this thing you know, with this idea, notion, expectation, or otherwise about what it's going to be. And then they write that check, buy that affiliate, do that thing. And then they're confronted with all the work that needs to be done beyond that point. And that to most people, I think is overwhelming. One of those, those two things that they always do have to confront is that one of those big fantasies they project is that they're going to be the fucking cool kid. They're going to buy their way into the kid, the, into the, the, the cafeteria table with the cool kids for the first time in their life. You know, maybe it's, that's a little bit extreme, but they're going to get that seat at the table. And then that's why they pursue every relationship as a personal reflection or a reflection of their inability to be the cool kid, right? When somebody quits, they're like, oh, you're reminding me of all the times I got picked on in high school, right? Like it becomes that thing or it becomes about money because they're like, oh, 
I'm just going to own this thing. I did the napkin math, 150 people at 150 bucks. I'm going to be rolling in Scrooge McDuck money. And then the expectation is not meet reality because they don't want to do any of the work to be there. Because if you look at it, it is, it's not that things are, are hard and it's not that things are shit inside the affiliate. It's that they want it to be easy. That's the first big problem. I don't know why anybody ever thought they're like, oh, I'm going to own affiliate. It's going to be easy. The reason is because you projected your fantasy into the future that you thought this thing was going to be so simple and so great and so glorious. It's a lot like going into any, any insert any CrossFit workout in here and being like, Murph's hard. Can I just walk? Maybe I'm just going to do jumping pull-ups. And then expecting that you're going to get appreciated like everybody else at the board who did it unbroken, unpartitioned, however they did it. And then you're going to be like, hey, I did it too. And this is this is a behavioral issue that I think has to be course corrected. I'm not advocating that there needs to be a higher barrier to entry to becoming an affiliate, but affiliate owners do need to understand that like the shit ain't easy. It wasn't supposed to be easy. And in fact, you want it to be easy, is it? And part of those things is it correcting or, or course correcting your your psychological limitations, like your beliefs around money, to answer Charles was saying, or like your beliefs around your validation and your value to your point about, you know making friends and then most importantly you don't have time so you're going to have to get other people to do it and back to that big piece of, of the time one so many people don't want to bring other people in and delegate this thing out because the thing that they fantasized about was becoming the important person and so the idea of delegating this task out seems like a mitigation of their own grandiose idea they had in their brain and that's that will always be an issue until someone comes in and goes uh did, do you realize how stupid that sounds well and i think Something that I think affiliate owners need to understand who have that mindset of like, oh, I thought this would be easier. Yeah. If you want to run a fitness facility and have someone tell you exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it, go open a franchise of something else. We're not a franchise. We're an affiliate. That means you're going to have to do the work. And, you know, sometimes, and Charles, worth you can agree or disagree with me. Sometimes I feel like some affiliate owners, a very minority, very small minority, by the way. Um, want you know champagne service for malt liquor prices Ooh, that's good schlitz malt liquor. you know and it's it's like yeah like we could we could tell you how like and I, i've explained this to some like affiliate owners i've talked to about like them some affiliates wanting more and more and more I'm like we could do that for you but in order for us to do that well we're going to need access to your finances we're going to need access to your member list we're going to need access to all these different informational things and then we can tell you exactly what to do and like mm -hmm. that sounds like a franchise i'm like it is. We don't want to be a franchise. We're not on a path to be a franchise. It's not a thing. Everyone would revolt if we, if we, when we say the word franchise. And I don't disagree. I like the affiliate method. I like, like pushing the 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 community forward by seeing who's doing things well and going after best practices. I think Greg had that exactly right in that sense. Um, and so I think when if people understand that, like, if you're an affiliate, it's going to be hard work. But just like CrossFit, that hard work will pay off if you have someone helping you find the path towards that that endpoint. Yeah, that's champagne service malt liquor prices. You know the Lisa, are we are we over? Should we end it? Uh, or can I comment yeah, on that? Yeah, you can comment on that. I'll let you have that one. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I Kevin, that's it's a small uh, minority. He, but very very small. Right. Very, I mean, I, uh, I can't. Even, I could probably count on one hand how many times oh. I've had to have that conversation in the seven to eight hundred affiliates that are in my region. And, and not only that, it's a small minority. It's the loud. And I will say this too: like, um, hopefully this doesn't get ripped, not from <laughs> us, but other people. Like, it. People who claim to be this like very very hardcore, it's only OG stuff, you know, ten plus year. That's also the loudest minority. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just we're turning into a franchise because we're trying to help. No, dude. No, absolutely not. And also, there are a lot, a majority of gyms that would actually hand over stuff and be like, hey, I I would love for you to see my member count and whatever. And I had people stand up at my summit. I had, uh, I'll call him out, cross a blow. No, Drew. Everyone loves this guy. <clears throat> he stood up at my summit. Tony, you weren't there. Should have been there. And he is a jack, dude. He deadlifts like 600 plus pounds. He's got this really deep, raspy voice. He owns his building. He does 20. He does, or sorry, I won't do his numbers, but he he does well. Okay. Um, and he literally goes, I'm going to try to do his voice. Raise the affiliate fee to 12 grand a year. Get all these guys out. You know, like, or 20 grand. I don't know what he said. You should have seen everyone look at him. 
but they kind of understood what he's talking about mm -hmm. because do that you're gonna really see who I, no we're not doing that but like when he stood up in front of everyone and said that you should you could have heard a pin drop it's like the old uh what's that guy the most famous like basically the most famous trainer um who am i talking about you know the bicep guy um oh um ct fletcher ct fletcher where he tells a story about his uncle or his cousin who comes in and said everyone shut up it's like you could have heard a pin drop that's exactly <laughs> how that sounded because he was loud and he wasn't wrong he had a feeling he was like raise it raise it crazy see what happens i, I, I'm, I'm I will say the majority of affiliate owners i talked to when we did the price change even the long-term ones i would say the vast vast high percentage minority my, my majority were like dude we get it this makes sense like you guys are providing a lot of value here um I mean, some of them are like, I wish I would have communicated a little differently. I wish I would have heard it from you first or something like that. Or like small nitpicky things. But they're like, you guys have done more for us in the last few years than we, we've seen in a long time. And you guys are really trying to put in the work sure. to see it. So I, I think that was the vast majority of it. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that that's a good point to stick a pin in it. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. Book market, because that means that we have to bring Kevin back on to finish this conversation. I think, I think we... That's guaranteed that we will have Kevin back for 2.0. Um, yeah. So we appreciate your time. As always, Andrew, Tony, appreciate yours as well. It's always good company. You hear the disdain um, in her voice and she said my name. <laughs> this is what I do. Favoritism at best. Uh, take take your emotions into account and, and yeah, see why I'll you're feeling that way. I'm, I'm going to go, go for a walk up. now. That's what I'm going to do. I'm about to have another call with Tony. I'm just mentally preparing myself for that. We'll get it back. So... <laughs> going to be an active participant in this next conversation um so uh enjoy your day gentlemen and thank you for your time and kevin we look forward to chatting to you again real soon i look forward to Thanks. it